This video is about stuff that you might mistake for opal. It's not about synthetic opal. That's a whole different story altogether. We're talking about materials that aren't deliberately trying to fool you. This is about unrelated minerals, biological materials, and man-made substances that you might, for one reason or another, confuse for opal. We tried to focus on the specific effects that you see in opal. In opal it's called the play of colour and it has some quantifiable properties. It displays the spectrum of visible light either in part or in full. It has optical depth beyond its physical depth so a thin piece of opal can have a pattern that gives the illusion of falling deep inside the stone even though that's not physically possible. And it changes colour and appearance depending on the direction you view it from. We had a lot of fun putting this list together and determining what belongs and what doesn't belong. But before we get to the best examples, here are some of the runners up and some weird and interesting things that we considered including in more detail but ultimately decided to leave behind. Perhaps we will revisit some of this stuff in future. Opalite is not actually opal, it's a man-made form of glass with some chemical inclusions. Mostly it's confusing because of its trade name, opalite. Uh, also moonstone, a feldspar mineral found on just about every continent with a blue shimmer. It's chemically very similar to another mineral that we'll see in a moment. Uh, we looked at some fairly common semi-precious minerals like tiger eye and hawk's eye, both uh, related chatoyant quartz minerals. Selenite is a chatoyant gypsum mineral. Numite is another chatoyant mineral from Greenland. Peacock ore or bornite is a sulfide mineral with a coloured tarnish. Some kinds of obsidian, this is golden sheen obsidian and this is rainbow or fire obsidian. There are other types that look even more like opal. There's sunstone from Sweden which has red and green copper inclusions. Goldstone is a man-made mineral which can have copper, cobalt or manganese inclusions to create different colours. Pawa or abalone shell, mother of pearl which is a naturally occurring organic inorganic composite material made from aragonite and found in the shells of many sea creatures. Pearls themselves which are made from the same material as mother of pearl but form under even weirder conditions that I'd really like to revisit in a future video because they are just strange. Getting even weirder some other things we looked at included the surface of peacock feathers which glisten in amazing colours using Using a process called structural colour. Some of the amazing colours, patterns and textures that you can find in insect carapaces which also exhibit structural colour. And even some really odd things like the glazes on Graham Anderson's amazing pottery which display a chatoyant effect as well as does the surface of some kinds of polished hardwoods. The surface of compact discs show the entire spectrum of colour and give the illusion of depth. Man-made holographic images tick almost all of the boxes that we were looking for. And even the shimmering pattern you see on the surface of an oil slick has properties that are similar in some ways to the colour in opal. All of these things have some kind of visual similarity to what you see in opal. Many are due to somewhat similar optical properties and many are completely different but they just create a similar outcome. So after reducing the list to something manageable, here are the most interesting, most beautiful and most opal-like non-opal substances that we could find with all the potential to confuse people. I spoke with Jenny at the Australian Opal Centre in Lightning Ridge about a few of these materials. So labradorite, we've got some lovely big lumps of labradorite and it is basically a feldspar mineral and what happens with labradorite is that it's made of minerals that are quite friendly when they're molten and as they begin to harden they get a bit uh, less friendly with one another and try to get away from one another and separate into layers. And so once it's a solid material, when white light passes through, it bounces around inside between those layers and it slows the speed of the light waves down and um, you end up with light coming out at different wavelengths um, than, than just the white. So we get beautiful sort of reddish coppery colors and the best known color in Labradorite is the blue. There are a number of beautiful blues. The, the effect or the sheen um, is a type of shiller, which is also specifically called labradorescence in labradorite. It's beautiful stuff, it really is. And again, I have seen people mistake this for opal. 
Labradorite, of course, isn't the only mineral that bears a striking resemblance to opal. So, what we have here is a little fish carved out of fire agate. What makes fire agate different from other agates is that it has this beautiful shimmering colour on it. Little rainbows of colour often in the red through orange, gold, back through green. It's often sort of bubbly looking. It's got what we call a botryoidal structure or a grape-like structure and that's actually the structure of the agate underneath. So that's a beautiful little fish in fire agate. It's found in quite a few places in the world. Arizona and Mexico are two good sources of fire agate. I can't quite remember, but I think this little guy might be from a place called Slaughter Mountain in Arizona. Outside of the world of geology, there are some biological materials that have optical properties that create similar effects to the play of colour in opal. This is a, the remains of a baculite, an extinct animal. So this is a fossil. Uh, it's a fossil of an animal that was similar to an ammonite. Now an ammonite was one of the spiralled mollusks that lived in the ocean. These little guys were like long straight ammonites in a way. And the reason we've got this here today is because the surface of its shell is beautiful iridescent ammonite. So it's a gem material. It's named for ammonites because it's most commonly found on ammonites, the relatives of these and it has a structure not unlike pearl maker that gives it this beautiful iridescent finish. This little guy is from Dakota in the United States. Absolutely beautiful stuff. Amylite is, is not uncommonly um, mislabeled or mistaken um, for opal. What we have here is some other pieces of amylite. Um, now these, these are actually pieces from much larger ammonites from Canada and they can come with incredible colours, um, brilliant reds, brilliant blues, brilliant greens that really can sometimes resemble opal. Um, and they're on a rich, dark background that's not unlike uh, the ironstone in boulder opal, so it can confuse people in that way. These have been stabilised with resin and that's usually done with this material because the gem amylite material is very thin. So beautiful colours, beautiful patterns. And again, this is from the structure of the material, which is actually more like the structure of the nacre that gives pearl its, its um, sheen than it is like opal. So a beautiful natural gem material. And while there is such a thing as man-made opal, which is a subject that we'll approach in a future video, there are also man-made substances that sometimes mimic opal-like properties, including a very common and very old man-made material. If glass is buried in soil in the right conditions, it will start to corrode and form what's called a weathering crust. And a weathering crust is, is made up of a bunch of layers, microscopic layers, which will start to interfere with the visible light that passes through the surface, and it creates an iridescent effect. I have some bits of glass here of various ages to show what that effect can look like. So these are some relatively young pieces of broken glass that were buried, and you can see they're just starting to develop a little shimmer of iridescence in a certain couple of patches. This is a beer bottle which was about probably between 40 and 60 years old. It's been buried in some black soil and it's starting to corrode quite nicely all over and it's developing a nice iridescent sheen. The longer glass is underground and the more corroded it gets the more stable the corrosion is on the surface. Stepping along a little further from that, we have these examples, which are from Broken Hill. These were buried in a, an informal landfill in someone's backyard, but were dug up many years later. Not entirely sure of the age of these, but they are way older than that beer bottle. They're all beautiful, aren't they? Mm, really gorgeous. And people often do describe these as opalized bottles. Mm -hmm. Or bottles with opal on them. Which they're not. Which they're not. And we have a piece that is even older than that. Probably around 1000 AD. We don't really know where it's from either, but it, Europe or Africa. I'm sure a bottle expert could tell us. But the colour's just stunning. Cool. So people are, are digging up ancient glass and making jewellery with it, setting it into jewellery, because it's just so beautiful with this effect from the corrosion.
And I have one last item, but only because it's kind of funny, and it's this stuff, which is blue plastic. It usually comes from these blue barrels that are used for water storage and flotation. I'm pretty sure statistically that this is the material that is most commonly mistaken for opal by people in the opal industry, but not for very long, and only under some really specific circumstances. This stuff isn't mistaken for opal because it looks like opal, but because of when and where it appears in the process of opal mining. After opal dirt is pulled from the ground, it gets washed in machinery like this. This is an agitator, which is a converted industrial cement mixer where opal dirt mixes with water and over time the softer material, the clay and the sandstone grind away, leaving only the harder stuff and hopefully the opal. The plastic from these blue barrels along with sometimes bits of glass and paint chips from the machinery and other debris end up in the agitator with the opal dirt and when the washed dirt is taken out of the agitator or tailed out, the bits of coloured junk come out as well. So more often than not, a miner sifting through washed opal dirt hoping to find a piece of coloured opal, might find a piece of coloured plastic instead. No one has fooled for very long, but I'm pretty sure every miner out there has a story of how they thought they'd found an amazing piece of opal, but it turned out to be plastic, or glass, or paint, or something else. This video was made with the support and participation of the Australian Opal Centre in Lightning Ridge. If you visit Lightning Ridge, you really should visit Lightning Ridge, it is an amazing place. If you visit Lightning Ridge, you should go and see the Australian Opal Centre. They have an amazing selection of opalized fossils, a whole bunch of other cool stuff, and some of the things that we looked at in this video. Um, speaking of this video, if you happen to enjoy this video, maybe you should consider subscribing to IDU Curiosity on YouTube and following along on social media, Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and all of those wonderful things and places and stuff. So thank you for watching. Maybe that's about it. Let's do some close ups. Or your DeLorean. Or your DeLorean, yeah. <laughs> bonnet of your DeLorean. Yeah. It's on the bonnet of my DeLorean. <clears throat> glass, glass sucks. I don't want to talk about it anymore. If. <laughs> if glass. If glass is buried in soil. Whoops. There's something I said last time that was completely and utterly wrong that I'm not going to repeat, so. I don't remember. Okay. But, you know, um, I'm, I'm over it. I hope you can get there soon. Okay, very good. With, actually, I have green and uh, purple and blue glass somewhere. And I went walking there after I got back from Tucson one year and there was just this piece of blue in the middle, like not where the tailings were. And I just saw blue plastic and it was opal. There you go. Mm hmm the absolute antithesis of my That's story. That's right. Shall we talk shells? If you like. Okay, would you like to talk shells? No. No, do I. <laughs> okay, well, let's move on. <laughs> Why is it so, Russell? That's a really good question I wish I knew the answer to. <laughs> <laughs> Another...